Hi there, welcome to the second F Sharp online meetup. I'm very happy that so many people are attending again. I think we have like about more than 200 um, confirmed participants now on, on, on meetup. And there are already more than, let me just see, oh, almost 100 people are online, 98 at the moment. So this is really cool. So thanks all for being here. This is our second F Sharp online meetup. Thanks for all the support on Twitter, on meetup. We have almost 400 um, people that are part of the group. On YouTube here, 300 people are following. So this is really cool. Thanks a lot for sharing and, and, and being here. This is a really awesome motivation doing all this, preparing all this and um, having a lot of fun with you. So um, what are we going to do today? Today we have uh, the great Paul Blazucci with us. <laughs> so let me just put them in and then you can say hi, Paul. Hello. I don't know about great, but I'm here. <laughs> um, so everyone, yeah, of course, and I'm really, me. really excited for this um, uh, and about the active pattern talk that you're going to give. So, um, if of course we had a lot of technical problems, like we have each and every time, and like now we have the problem. It's it seems to be that there is quite a delay um, with Paul's voice and his mouse. <laughs> so um, I I hope to fix it. But let's see if this will uh, work out. Now we can only see his belly. That's also pretty good. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, yeah, how are you doing? I am good. I am well. I am excited for this. This is my first... Uh... Yeah, this is my first presentation of any kind in in probably almost two years. So that's it's been a while. Uh, but no, I'm excited. This is cool. I'm trying to make the best of of the crazy times we live in, you know. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to share some of, of what, what I, some of my take on on sort of this F sharp feature with that's the larger pretty... community. I'm stoked that we have so many yeah, people what, what attending. Was your... Oh, I mean, this is all. We already have more than 115, so I guess we will reach something close to 200. So this will be pretty cool. Will be a big meeting then. So no pressure. That, that's, that's actually <laughs> so, really cool. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it's probably the largest crowd awesome. I've ever spoken for. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> um, so, so when we had our pre-talk on Sunday, you told me that you had quite a bad luck with your glasses, which is um, so your glasses broke basically. Yeah, uh, so I was able to sort of tape the, uh, glue them back together a little bit with uh, with some glue. So we'll see how well they hold up. They might, I, they might get, they might drop off halfway through the presentation. I've been been fighting with them all week. So uh, if I suddenly futz with my glasses, it's because the lens fell out. And really, a poor poor design. It's metal on like one side, and then just a piece of like piano wire underneath so like when the metal gets too loose the piano wire doesn't have enough yeah. slack to hold the lens in place oh, yeah and it's, it's, a, a it's the best best timing right now but, yeah everything is closed down so you're oh, in yeah. the netherlands well, right well, this is yes i'm in the netherlands and we are not formally on government lockdown but we've been told to restrict our movements to only essential things yeah. and and shelter in place and only go out if you have to and so you know, now is not a great time for like replacing glasses <laughs> or, or other things so so we'll see how we do, I, we'll see how we do. We'll see how we i'm pretty through. sure it will but be great right. so do you have anything to say before we um what is that nice headset model what's the question Ah, yes. So this nice headset that I just acquired recently is a uh, HyperX Cloud 2, which I'm told is, is quite nice. I know nothing about video games or gaming, except that uh, the gaming community has really like high-end audio stuff that they use. So I thought this was good to uh, to help with you know me having good audio uh, during my yeah, presentation. Yeah, it's pretty cool, because so, in the pre-check, we, yeah. we had the worst uh, audio ever. And, and so Paul took, <laughs> took yeah, the effort just and just pretty bad. ordered I mean, another one or a new one for all you for this um, presentation. So, uh, yeah. Well... I'll be I'll be working remotely. I mean, I'll be doing more remote work for the foreseeable yes, future. Everyone. So uh, this will come in <laughs> handy. Uh, <laughs> everyone, it's secretly a plot so that people will go buy better headphones. Might be. So I I, I also have hyper. So I, I really like those. It's it's actually the my, the first headset where my head is not. I have a pretty big head with glasses, 
and big ears. And so this is not the first one where, or this is the first one where my head is not exploding after 10 minutes. So it's a good one. So, okay. People say thanks, Roman. Yeah. So I also say thanks to the other Roman. He He's not here at the moment with the live meetups because we don't have Zoom yet or any other thing we, we, where we can easily have a lot of people without too many glitches. I know we can do it also with Skype, but... Let's see for the future, but he's also, we're doing this together. He's helping me. We, we're discussing this thing a lot and how to do this and how to, how to go on. So also thanks to Roman, the other Roman. Okay, so I'd say without further ado, let's um, just dive into it. Los geht's, as I always say. And do you want to share your screen? Yep, I'm on it. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's get to it. Okay, so uh, deep dive into active patterns. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Blazucci. I've been with the community for uh, time. I am currently the treasurer for the F Sharp Software Foundation. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join. It's free and you get lots of cool stuff. Um, but uh, we have here, if you're looking for more information on me, just people Zucci anywhere on the web, you'll find me. And this link, which will also be available on all the slides, is a short link to the GitHub repo that contains the slide deck and all of the code samples that we're going to go through. Cool. Hey, let, so we're going to talk wait, a bit maybe about... Maybe one, one thing before we actually... Sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, we, we forgot oh, yeah, to, no. to, to talk about questions. So again... Um, yeah, okay. If you have questions, just put them in the chat. I will write them down and we will have as much time as we need in the end for questions. But there were also like two or three natural breaks in the, in the, in the talk um, where if I feel that there are questions that can be answered, then um, I would just um, interrupt him then and go in there. I will mute myself now. So... I won't um, blabber you now and, and interrupt you now. So, but so if you have any questions, just put them in. And if there are any technical problems, please just put them in the chat. We try to, I try to figure things out as fast as I can. So I'm quiet now. S keep going. Cool. So, uh, active patterns. Uh, active patterns. We're gonna go deep on them. Sort of the format, like Roman said. There'll be a few natural pauses. What we'll do is. Do a sort of quickish but but broad tour of the whole feature, uh, showing some code samples, but not necessarily going too much into detail of the mechan the syntax. More just talking about the whys and the hows, and then after the deck, we'll go into some actual worked examples where we'll look at like a before and after, two of them actually, where we see some okay F sharp code. And then we see what active patterns can do to improve that code in a couple of different scenarios. So, you know, hopefully people will get a better sense of where and when and how to use active patterns. Um, disclaimer, I did give this talk about four years ago. I have rewritten pretty much the whole thing. So uh, hopefully it's not too... Uh, uh, not too boring for people who've seen this before. But uh, my goal with this was really to have some more useful examples because... If you do a cursory Google for active patterns, there's some good examples that tell you sort of like the base mechanics of it. But I always felt like some of the examples were a little contrived or a little too isolated. So hopefully when we get to some of the bigger worked examples in the end, it'll start to click for people more. But let's set the stage a bit. What is active patterns? Well, before we can talk about active patterns, we have to talk about pattern matching. Right, and I'm I'm assuming you know, normally if we were all in the same room, I would do like a show of hands thing. But I'm assuming everyone here is familiar at least with the concept of pattern matching. Uh, it's it's prominent in a lot of statically typed functional programming languages, and is slowly making its way into other languages where you could uh, debatably call them uh, statically typed and debatable debatably call them functional programming languages. And it's basically this idea of rules for transforming input data, you know, basically letting you compare data with logical structures or decompose data in, into constituent parts or in some meaningful way, abstract data for, or abstract information or, huh, excuse me, extract information from data, uh, abstract and extract. I always get those two mixed up. Um, you could see here just some random examples. I 
actually pulled from uh, from MSDN, uh, uh, which are just random examples of different kinds of pattern matching, matching on constants, and you know, matching on exception types, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, matching for nulls and whatnot, decomposing a list. So pattern matching is good generally. We like it. It makes code declarative. It makes code, I think, a little bit easier to read. It definitely lets you shift your focus more to the problem space and not sort of how your Turing complete von Neumann architectured underlying hardware works, which you would get with more like procedural code. So, but everything is not all sunshine and roses with pattern matching. Pattern matching is not first class as, as, uh, the folks who devised active patterns tend to refer to it. In fact, there are a lot of limit to pattern matching, uh, the first and most important of which is there are only actually 16 kinds of patterns uh, that the compiler knows about, and they are all hard-coded into the compiler. Like, the compiler is specifically programmed to recognize these 16 patterns. That's it. There's all 16 of them on the screen there for you. And, I mean, I think it's maybe even debatable to call it 16. I don't know. Uh, jury still out on parenthesized pattern as an actual pattern, like it's a pattern that you put parentheses around a thing. But anyway, uh, um, the point is, so that's our first limitation: is that we um, they're hard coded into the compiler, um, and they're also they're not usable as data. They're not first class. I can't I can't pass them into functions. I can't compose new patterns from old patterns. I can do some nesting of patterns. Uh, also, as an aside for people who may may oh um, yeah. So so after compose mm. you were gone. You can't okay. really compose. Yeah now? yeah you're back now. Um, it was a, okay, a yeah. Skype uh, yes. hiccup. So you yeah you can't really compose patterns. I mean you can a little bit. That's sort of what the the and and or patterns are for are for composing, but you can't really do some of the more things you would think of with first class elements of a language. You can't treat them as data. You can't, for instance, uh, have patterns that return new patterns. You can't pass them as arguments to functions. That sort of stuff. So they're not first class and they're hard coded into the compiler. As an aside, I found this interesting when I first found this out many years ago. I don't know if other people will. I always thought patterns were sort of this pattern matching was sort of this very magical, very sort of uh, high tech thing that happens in the compiler. But it turns out once you look into it, it's actually really simple. The compiler, when it sees a pattern, it just has some hard coded logic to turn it into some simpler uh, control structure that it already knows about, whether it's a, uh, a uh, an if statement or uh, a jump statement or, or what have you. So it turns out they're not that magical under the covers. But the other, other thing, especially in F sharp, especially in the context of uh, uh, the common language runtime interoperating with, with C sharp, is that it. Uh, I'm going to use a a euphemism from again from the the uh, creators of, of of active patterns where they describe it as it interacts poorly with abstraction, which I think is a polite way of saying that there's no good way to get data out of typical OOP OOAD style code like you find all over the base class libraries and and coming out of most you know C sharp libraries uh, there's no good way to declaratively extract that data out and now that is changing uh, in recent versions of C sharp at least though a lot of those changes are very limited and haven't really propagated their way into the BCL and aren't necessarily exposed in a way that is consumable from F sharp um, but this is a great example here this is uh, the classic case of we want to do something with reflection and because we can't pattern match over system.type, which is sort of the, the, the building block of all, all the reflection work that you would do, you instead wind up with these really gnarly, nasty, nested if statements. And I'm not expecting anyone to understand this code. I'm not going to go through it. This is dense code. Um, the point is, this is the sort of thing you normally deal with with object code. And pattern matching can't help me here. There's really not anything pattern matching can do for me here. So those are sort of the, the pros and cons of pattern matching. And to sort of bridge the gap and address them and add some of the cool stuff, we enter this awesome paper from 2007 that was a, a formal paper 
paper uh, submitted to IFCP. Uh, and I actually think I have that backwards. I actually think it's a typo. I actually think it's ICFP, but uh, you know, that's, that's all right. I was typing quickly. And you can see the authors here are Don Syme, uh, Mr. Neverov, and Mr. Margotson. And what they do in this paper is they introduce this concept of active patterns as a way to have extensible pattern matching in the language, as a way to really make pattern matching a powerful and flexible feature, really make it properly first class. Um, and to that end, they I think they did a really good job with it. Um, when we get towards the end of the presentation, we'll talk a bit about the actual mechanics and what these things look like. When we get to it, you'll see that the way active patterns are realized under the covers is very very intuitive. It's very cleanly orthogonally integrated into the rest of the language, and it, it holds the same sort of uh, soundness that you come to expect from working with F# -sharp and its its features and its type system. But uh, for now, I just want to do a quick tour of digging into the different kinds of active patterns, because there's actually four, five kinds of active patterns. So the first kind is sort of the simplest case, what we call a single case total pattern. And what these are really good for, you're mostly going to use these where if you think about um, functions in the mathematical sense as being a mapping from a, uh, a domain to a range, uh, you're mostly going to use these in places where that mapping is what we would consider total, meaning for every possible input, you expect to have a valid output. You know, um, These are, are uniquely things that they have identity, they can um, be, there, there are optimizations and completeness checks that happen to them. And it's honestly re really best to think about them as sort of the way you would think about a view in a relational database system or a uh, projection or a map reduce in sort of like a document store or, or, or stream system where basically, they just give you a different shape of some underlying data. Like the example you can see here, you have this complex type in system.numerics, which has a real part and an imaginary part. And sometimes you want to work with the real and the imaginary part for certain calculations, like addition. But then you can also express complex numbers with a magnitude and a phase, which makes certain other operations, sort of this polar representation, uh, possible. And what we have here is this, this nice, clean way of saying, hey, take this type and reinterpret it to look like this, you know, to have this other shape. So um, these are really, really killer for taking just bits and pieces out of an otherwise uh, clunky uh, object. Um, a lot of times this can even, even if you're not using like traditional like uh, POCOs and whatnot, even with things like records, using these sort of single case active patterns can lead to um, much cleaner code. So uh, moving on, the next kind here would be, you know, sort of that was single case total patterns. This is going up one level. Now we have multi-case total patterns. And this one is all about bucketing. If you think about uh, this, this is each one of those values in between those pipes, that's a bucket. And what you're saying with a multi-case pattern is, you know what? Whatever input data you're giving me, I want to carve it into one of n buckets. Maybe it's you know two buckets, maybe it's three buckets. Uh, side note: currently, as implemented, uh, uh, multi-case patterns only go up to seven cases. But uh, Don has uh, uh, intimated that it would be easy to have them go to an arbitrary number of cases, similar to like the the work that the compiler does with tuples. No one's ever put it in though. So uh, what's cool about these is they, again, they have identity. They are a, a, a uniquely named, a strongly named known concept in the space of the available patterns, the available names in the system. They can be checked for exhaustivity. What do we mean by that? They work sort of like an anonymous union. If you think about how one of the, the key features of discriminated unions is that the compiler tells you when you haven't covered a case. Well, that also happens for multi-case active patterns. Like if I were to not, uh, well, anyway. And they're again good for partitioning data into many buckets, which is also again, uh, can be thought of as sort of a view or a shape of existing data, like in this case, parsers, I don't know how many people here work with node at time, but since C-sharp doesn't have a generic 
result type like like we would have in 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 F sharp. There are a lot of libraries that create these result like shapes, but they're all very specific to uh, you know the domain they're in, and they tend to be based around sort of unsafe access and knowing that you have to check things before you access certain values and whatnot. Um, but and parse results is an example of that, and you get it when you parse out a, a date or a time time or what have you in no time. But you can see it's very easy to uh, wrap this uh, you know, very procedural conditional if then else logic into an active pattern and boom, now when I work with it, it works just like I'm working with a union, just like I'm working with, you know, F sharp results, you know? It could easily I mean it I deliberately didn't choose to call it okay and error because that would have caused some some ambiguities, but it's the same concept. So hopefully you could see how this is uh, a good way of, of sort of, again, taking these things that are not in the shape of, of the algebraic data types and the pattern matching that we're used to in F-sharp and bringing them in, sort of bridging the gap. Uh, and yeah, I'll be curious to see. There's been a few proposals on the language design uh, GitHub about anonymous unions, and I'll be curious to see an analysis of the cases where anonymous unions are a better fit than an active pattern. Uh, and obviously, also, I'm sure somebody out there in the audience is nodding, well, why didn't you just create an actual union? Why didn't I create an actual union? Um, Actual unions are, I could have done that, but then it's a little bit heavier, it's a little bit chunkier. This is sort of a lighter and faster way of working with things. And as you'll see as we go on, there are some added benefits to active patterns that frankly a union couldn't support. So we've done two kinds. We've done multi, a single case total patterns, multi case total patterns. Uh, and now we're going to step away from totality. We have a lot of things where we don't always have an output for every input. That's the whole sort of point of the option type, right? It's a type that generically represents, hey, not every value you give me might, might you know, produce something meaningful on the other side. So we have partial patterns. What are partial patterns? You notice here now, instead of two, you know, two values separated by pipes, I've got a value, a name on one side of my pipe, and then an underscore on the other side of the pipe, uh, you know, underbar. And what we're saying here is partial patterns are not uh, checked for exhaustivity because you can't. You want them specifically in cases where you don't know all of the inputs. Um, they are they are particularly nice in that they're very flexible and composable, and you can actually arbitrarily bring together many of them. If you want to see a really great example, I couldn't put it in here because I couldn't fit it uh, well into the paper but, or into the presentation, but if you ever go look at the uh, quotations support in the F-sharp core libraries, you know, uh, F-sharp.quotations and F-sharp.reflection, um, that's a really great API designed entirely around partial patterns, partial active patterns, and then there's one multi-case total pattern. And all of the sort of working with it is very clean, very declarative, very composable and powerful. So really, really great API. I really like that one. And here you could see what we've done is we've created a very application-focused but incomplete view of our, our data. And in this case, I've got a, an event type, and I've got, you know, it's got a couple of events. I pushed a file into some mythical file system. I popped a file out of, at some path out of a mythical file system. Maybe this is some, like, virtualized file system like you might see in a, you know, an online storage management or something. But the point is, I can use this partial active pattern to say, hey, wait, if I have exactly this sequence of these two events, I can treat it like sort of a synthetic third event. And then when I'm matching, I can choose to match on, you know, one event or another event, or my synthetic event that under the covers is really these two smaller events composed in a specific sequence. And you could see you're, you're hopefully you can you could see how this could extend to more general, more general APIs and this idea of building up abstractions from, from smaller things. Uh, because obviously if I've put if I've pushed and popped uh, a file and the name was different, but the uh, path was, or sorry, the path was different, then clearly I've moved the file. You know, you can imagine another one like these, maybe called file renamed, where I check that the paths are the same, but the actual 
file name at the end of the path is different, you know, and things like that. So um, anyway, so that's partial active patterns, really useful. Honestly, partial active patterns, so if, if we look at the three we've looked at so far, uh, single case total patterns, I tend to use kind of regularly, but you don't see them in the wild as much as you would think. Multi-case total patterns, really, really obvious use cases for them. Partial patterns, partial active patterns, really, really, really powerful, come up quite a lot, really quite useful. Um, good juju. Going one step further, you can have parameterized patterns. Uh, now, interestingly, um, you can parameterize any kind of pattern, but you typically only parameterize uh, uh, partial patterns, because if you parameterize total patterns, you potentially interfere with the exhaustivity checking. Uh, and with the notion of identity semantics. So you can do it. I have done it on occasion, but it's not super common. But absolutely, with, uh, uh, with you know, partial patterns, putting uh, parameterizing them is great. And what do we mean by parameterizing them? We're just adding extra arguments that could be used in the calculation. So we have here, you know, uh, the rightmost input to the pattern is still the thing we're ultimately matching against. But anything that comes before it, and you could have one, two, three, and however many you want, these are additional pieces of data that are used to inform the behavior of the pattern. Uh, and what we've done here with this guy is pretty simple. I've created a partial pattern where, given a regular expression that contains some groups, I pull those groups out into a uh, you know into a list where each element of the list is a group. Obviously, this is a bit of a contrived example, and you're not going to scale this out to like parsing large documents or whatever. But for small things, it's 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 sort of useful. It certainly illustrates the point where you know if we look down at that uh, grouped uh, in the match statement there, that first argument, that regular expression, that's our extra parameter. And what we're actually matching on is the, of course, the, the hex color string that's in the, uh, the match with block. And then what's after that, that's the output. So we've actually, we're spitting back new data. We're changing the shape of the data. We're saying, take this string, based on this additional parameter, change the shape of the string into something else. In this case, a list of three uh, component values. So that is partial selective patterns. Um, so let me see. Uh, oh, side note, as hopefully you start to get a hint of from looking at these things, active patterns have something, and this is going to sound a little weird, something in common with uh, generic data types and with type providers and with other things. The more general purpose they are, the better utility have they have, the more sort of value they intrinsically bring, the more generic they are if that makes sense. And I don't necessarily mean generic in terms of CLR generics. I mean generic in terms of, you know, generally applicable. Um, for instance, this grouped uh, active pattern is generally applicable, more so than if I specifically defined a partial active pattern that only ever concerned itself with pulling three values out of a hex string, right? And you'll move the regex inside the pattern, or sorry, inside the, uh, yeah, in, inside the active pattern. That would be less useful. So thing to think about. So we've done four so far. We've done recapping. We've done single case total, multi case total, uh, uh, parameterized, and uh, partial. And then the fifth kind, it's not really a kind. It's really more showing off, really the beautiful first class nature of active patterns. And that is what we call first class patterns. And that is the idea that I can have patterns that are composed of other patterns. I can have patterns that are, you know, functions that take patterns as input, functions that spit back uh, patterns as output, you know, patterns that are created by partially applying other patterns. So really the full breadth and scope of what we consider first class uh, language elements. And you could see an example of that here, where I defined a generic unfold function, where one of the inputs to that function is an active pattern, this Q function, which would really just be a, and I mean, Q is a uh, maybe not the best name here, but uh, basically it's a, a thing that pulls some values out of the input, and then we can pass them along to the next iteration. 
You can see elsewhere, you know, where we might use it, I define a very, very trivial and simple uh, discriminated union, which encodes basically the lambda calculus, right? This is application uh, variables and, uh, you know, lambdas. And then we define a partial active pattern, which um, extracts some information from part of our expression, basically identifying is this expression a lambda? If so, get the head and the body. And then you can see we can build a new active pattern by parameterizing our unfold function with our lambda, with our partial active pattern. So we've got this very fluid, higher order style of working with patterns. Um, this especially becomes useful when you start mixing in uh, the AND pattern, which is the ampersand, if you've ever seen it inside match statements. Uh, it's sort of the logical dual to the OR pattern. We'll see actually some examples of that when we go to the worked examples in a little while. Um, and let's see, the, I mean, basically, the next slide is sort of the giveaway of why active patterns get to become first class. So we'll get there. Um, this is basically, we're talking about the underlying mechanics now of how active patterns actually work. And surprise, surprise, they're just functions with a little extra bit of metadata. Like, that's it. Like, so literally, well, not literally, but very nearly anything you can do with a function, you can do with an active pattern. Hence making them first class, hence making them really powerful, hence being able to have higher order functions and higher order patterns and passing patterns as inputs and returning patterns as outputs and partially applying patterns and so on and so forth. And you could see here for the four main kinds of patterns, uh, the forms, the compiler maps them onto syntactic structures that the compiler already knows about, different function definitions. If you've ever seen the type F-sharp choice, you'll see that's what's used for multi-case total patterns. So if I have a multi-case total pattern with three cases, it'll turn into a function that takes some input and spits out uh, a choice three, right? Or a choice two or a choice four or choice seven. Uh, single case total patterns are great. It's just literally just a function, but you have this extra metadata associated with it that the compiler is aware of so that you can use it in match statements. You can use it in let bindings. You can use it with the function keyword to make shorter lambdas and so on and so forth. And then you could see for partial patterns, uh, whether parameterized or not, the mapping is, is it becomes a function that maps an input to an option where it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then obviously for the parameterization, we're just adding many parameters. So instead of being a, a, a function with an arity of one input and one output, it becomes, you know, n number of inputs to our optional output. Uh, interesting side note, um, we've talked about uh, parameterized partial patterns, and certainly while I haven't shown them, you can do parameterized single case patterns. Par uh, Multi-case partial patterns were considered and are considered and are discussed and given in the paper uh, that introduces active patterns, but they don't actually exist in the F-sharp language, in the F-sharp compiler and F-sharp core. Uh, because the authors and people who work on the language and so on and so forth have never found a compelling use case. I've never found an actual use case for I want eight or not, you know, six or seven different buckets or nothing. Um, and I guess that's reasonable because if you think about it, if you do have that wild card at the end, you can always just add a. You can always just add a. Uh, you, know, you could just add an unknown bucket on the end. Um, okay, so now is probably a good inflection point because I've been, you know, rambling off at the mouth for a solid forty minutes with with no one to like nod their head or or tell me they're falling asleep or or throw produce at me or anything. So now is probably a good point for me to take a breather. And if there are any questions that are appropriate, Roman, at this junction, love to love to field them. Otherwise, yeah, let me on. let me see. So first of all, you get some some feedback that your slides are awesome. That's pretty good. Um, sometimes we. Oh. I, <laughs> I'll Sometimes we had some 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 sound hiccups. Um, we never had this in the in the pre pre talk, so let's see. But I think it's all right. It's Skype, I guess. Um, but it should be fine. Um, let me see. 
There were Thomas. Uh, he had two questions. Um, he he came prepared. He he basically put them in the first second of the <laughs> of the of the talk. So he was and and you Excellent. can say if this is a good place to to ask them now or maybe later. Um, he said you can have multiple layers of active patterns and you can have recursive patterns, um, active patterns. How do you know that your abstraction doesn't leak? How do you know that your abstraction doesn't leak? That's a great question. Um, I suppose, first of all, uh, you know, at a certain level, all abstractions are are leaky, mm -hmm. right? At some level. Um, uh, I guess I don't really fully understand what a... Uh, yeah, what, what is the, yeah. I can understand how a, a, a nested pat or layers of patterns could become leaky leaky uh but a recursive pattern i would think similar to a recursive function the places where you want to use those are for these times where you have these very cyclical mm -hmm. uh structures so i would i wouldn't expect much much you know i wouldn't expect the notion of leaky abstraction to fit there but really honestly it's a very context dependent sort of question like i, I hate to punt and be like it depends the consultant says it depends but but um, it really does kind of depend on the the pattern and the context and and where you're trying to set your boundaries because because you know if we could be a little philosophical for a minute abstraction and indirection in software are, are powerful tools but they exist in a certain context and they exist to further a certain aim and really it's the measure of how successful you are in achieving that aim in that context and and I, I kind of can't give you a, an across the board okay. answer there. So what else? Um, he also asked how to test that a parser will cover all the cases of possible input matches. For example, quotations at S. How do you know it covers all the quotations? Oh, okay. So um, there's a couple of things. Uh, it doesn't. Like by by definition. Um, if you do this is, so there's there's a couple of things here but if you're doing a match statement against a whole bunch of partial patterns which you will mm -hmm. do if you work with quotations you kind of don't know that everything is covered you have to put a wild card in there and be able to to deal with that you could also do a certain amount of testing i mean it's a it's a documented api and you know that uh, you know the quotation space can represent this 99% of structures in the language and you can check that you have one for each of those and and write a test for that potentially do something clever with with um, yeah, a property based that. testing or something but th there is especially in partial patterns there is this element of uncertainty that you have to account for and that's that's just sort of how it is. Um, another way to think about it is because a partial pattern always maps onto an option, uh, you always have a none case somewhere that you have mm -hmm. to account for. Yes. Same as with an option, right? It's just you can have se it's just that you can have several of them, and the compiler is sort of smart enough to let you get away with mm -hmm. just having a single none case. Um, However, uh, there are enough smarts and optimizations in the compiler that it will, a lot of the same sort of uh, warnings you get from match statements on just regular match constructs, uh, you may have a case that's not matched or, or this case will never be matched. Those sorts of things are still detected even when you use mm -hmm. active patterns. So you're not totally lost. And as far as a multi-case total pattern goes, if you forget to include a case in the match statement, there the compiler will straight up tell you, hey, look, dude, you might have missed a case here. This thing has six cases, and you've only given me five. So it's really only the partial patterns where you have to watch out. And again, it's just like, just always think to yourself, there's a none case that I have to account okay. for. Same yeah. as working with options. Yeah, makes sense. So Okay, that, so that there helps. are a couple of more, but I would like to put them in the end. Um... Let's just keep going with the examples, I guess. Cool. So I okay. will switch back to your screen. Cool, cool. Cool, cool. All right. So I will come out of my uh, presentation for a minute. Uh, there's the Git repo in case people need it. Um, and I will come over to Visual Studio. Let's close you. Um, in the Git repo, you'll see that there's the, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentation. 
And then there's really two separate worked examples. One is doing color space transformations, which is one of those weird, quirky things that I've always been deeply pathologically interested in uh, ever since art school. And then another one is just a, a small uh, console-based game. In earlier versions of this talk, it had been a simple guessing game. Uh, in this version, I've sort of evolved it to be the classic high-low game where you have to guess is the next number going to be bigger or smaller, which is not a, a good thing to gamble on or turn into a drinking game, but it's fun nonetheless. So I guess maybe we'll look at the high-low game first. Um, it mostly makes use of partial patterns and active patterns, or partial patterns and higher-order patterns and parameterized patterns. Uh, both projects are set up the same way. This is all targeting uh, .NET Core, so you, you will need sort of uh, latest and greatest to, to do this. Uh, folks who are still purely on .NET Framework, now is the time to upgrade. .NET 5 is .NET Core. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It is Silverlight's revenge. Um, anyway, each one has a before and an after file where we look at sort of how we change things. Um, I've included script files because there'll be some playing around with things that's sometimes useful. And then there's usually uh, an entry point in case you want to actually run it as an executable. So I think before we go actually look at the code, let's do that. Let's actually just take a minute and do this. And we'll run our high-low game, so you can see what a couple of runs of the game looks like. And then we'll go look at the before code and dig in. And it's not that complicated. We'll quickly transition to the after code to see what it looks like. Great. So ah, the current card is three. Do I think the next card is going to be higher or lower? I think the next card is going to be lower. Oh, my goodness. OK, and you can see how this game uh, you know, goes on. If we play another couple of rounds, if I get it right this time, you could see your current card is nine. Let's go with higher. Lucky guess. 12, let's go with lower, lucky guess. And you can see it's keeping track of how many cards in a row I got. Um, anyway. Ah. Ooh. Okay, so we'll, we'll move a little bit slower to give the screen time to catch up. Uh, but basically, you can see here, it's a simple guessing game where you say the next number is going to be higher or lower. And you're either right or wrong. And and I think it's important. Uh, I, I just um, unmuted myself that this um, the current card is is a debugging statement just for us to see, right? No, no. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Oh, sorry, game. I totally got this wrong. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, the game is, hey, ah, okay. you've got a 12 on the table. I'm going to turn over another card. Do you think the next card I turn over is going to be bigger than 12 okay. or smaller than 12? Um, yes. And sometimes you get it right. And, okay, I and got it. Got it. You got get it. it wrong. And I was oh, able to sorry. Go two cards. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. So simple enough. If we did want to see a cheat with the uh, debugging, because this is a little hard sometimes, we can actually do this. Good that you bring that up. We can use FSI, which I'm so glad is finally making a comeback in in F# -sharp 5 and in, in in the next version of .NET because, wow, I miss FSI. Uh, bu -bu. See, now I've got my debug statement, Roman. <laughs> so the current card is three. The next card is 11. So if I wanted to be smart, yay. If I wanted to be dumb, yay. Okay. Cool. So we've seen this now. Uh, now let's go look at the actual code that supports this. So we're still looking at the before, so there's no active patterns involved here. Just a very, very simple uh, it's a game loop that sits over a recursive function. And the recursive function accumulates how many streaks you're on and what the current card is. It goes in and it draws the next card without showing it to the player. It prints out some stuff. It uh, it prompts and then waits for input. And then we have this sort of match statement to cover the various input cases. And this is really the business logic here, right? You know, uh, basically, which card is bigger, which card is smaller. And 
this code is, if, if, if I can be honest, I, I think this code is okay. Like, I don't think this is bad code. Like, if I was on a team somewhere and somebody submitted this code, I would be like, okay, this is okay code. But uh, we could do better. Like, especially if we ignore all the string literals and everything. Like, I th think we can do better and get something cleaner at the expense of writing a few more lines of code. So uh, let's go look at the after version. Okay. So the after version, we again have our, our main uh, game function, which is again just sitting over a recursive loop that tracks your streak and the current card. But you can see we've we've defined a bunch of helpers here. We've defined you know uh, an, a partial active pattern that that tries to get a character from a string, and we've got some parameterized patterns that when we look at them, you'll see they tell you uh, whether a value is high or low. And then uh, we've got this last fun, this build rules, which just creates a pair of uh, active patterns by partially applying to other active patterns. So it's maybe a bit contrived, but you can see you've got um, you know, a pattern, a parameterized pattern, which makes use of a pattern underneath, and then this sort of higher order work of patterns of returning patterns as output, meaning this is data. So the actual, where we use them in the actual game loop, I think it actually makes the game loop just a bit cleaner and clearer. We still start by, uh, you know, printing out some info and then getting the next card. Here we go ahead and we get our sort of, we invoke our, our function and our sort of higher order patterns with the actual parameters fixed. So basically taking two partial patterns fixing partially applying two pattern to inputs to them and getting back to new to sort of a residue partial patterns uh, i use the word partial there a lot i don't know if that was helpful um and then you could see here i feel like the game logic just gets much clearer right so instead of having to deal with if we put these side by side for a minute the screen's a little small for this but you could see here we were doing our, our function to read in our IO uh, or read in our input and then immediately parsing it and trying to parse into a character and dealing with this ugly tuppling because this try parses a CLR function. So what it really wants to give you is uh, a Boolean and an out parameter, but F sharp gives you a little bit of sugar to turn them into a tuple, but that's still too ugly for me. So I went and turned it into a partial active pattern, where basically we're parsing a string into a car. And I think that reads really cleanly. And then here you could see we're, we're matching the input on our, if we, if we trace the flow here, I think this is kind of interesting to trace, right? So we call a scanfn, it gives us back some string of input from the console or from standard IO or from wherever, and we match it against high or low. And high or low here, we're saying match this against this partial pattern. This partial pattern is actually built by adding some, passing some parameters to another partial pattern. And that partial pattern is in turn using a partial pattern to define the business logic, a, another partial pattern to define the business logic. So I don't know if this helps people see with their questions about leaky abstractions, but hopefully you start to see where there's a little bit of, of, of reuse here, a little bit of more utility of these things. Um, and then I think just when you're in your main loop here, this just looks really clean and simple. It's just really much easier, at least for me, to see what the cases are here, right? You know, I've got a case where I'm playing the game and I've guessed correctly whether that that's high or low, or I'm quitting because I've hit the quit character, or anything else is bad input and I just dump out. Uh, and bad input here includes something that I couldn't parse into a character or something that was neither in the correct high-low range. It was neither high nor low, it was the opposite. So not high and not low. Um, and so hopefully you could see this was a, not a ton of work. It adds maybe 10 lines of code, but it... Uh, maybe less if you don't count white space, but it uh, it does, I think, clean things up a bit. So, um, you know, that's that's sort of working with some higher order patterns and working with some parameterized patterns, working with some partial patterns and using them in particular to 
reshape some CLR APIs that are a bit ugly and to uh, more explicitly encode some business logic that is otherwise fairly implicit. Like this is one of those things I, I tweeted out at a thing at, I don't remember who it was, uh, somebody, maybe, maybe it was Matt Cruz or somebody a while ago where I rattled off a whole bunch of different general use cases for active patterns. And one of them is very much taking business rules and, and, and things that are otherwise somewhat implicit in the, in the logic and codifying them a bit more explicitly, making them a bit more obvious. And I feel like, again, if you go back to this, uh, the the logic is sort of drowned out in all the mechanics, and I feel like this sort of helps us, uh, you know, not have that problem quite so much, or at least put it in little corners where it's easier to digest and and dig into piecemeal. Also, I should have pointed out at the start of this talk, because active patterns at the end of the day are just functions with metadata, and because F# -sharp is such a robust and and uh, sound language, a lot of what we're going to talk about here very much is in the realm of sort of subjective things, very much in the realm of of taste and preference and how do you think this reads versus how that reads. Certainly, there's nothing you're going to do with active patterns, or almost nothing you're going to do with active patterns other than using them in a match that you couldn't do with a function. So uh, I should have mentioned that before. But uh, that's all I really had for this smaller example. I don't know if there are questions at this point uh, about specifically anything before I go on to the next example. I don't think there are any questions. Can you reopen the build rules again, please? Yeah, So sure. So, and here, build rules are two active patterns, right? So, one and two. You know, uh, you're good. No. One, yes. One and two are just yes. any two mm -hmm. arbitrary values that yes. support comparison. And then they're both the yes, inputs to these other active okay. patterns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and maybe, uh, maybe where it gets confusing is I... Um, mm. I reuse the names here because shadowing mm -hmm. is sometimes a useful trick, uh, especially with you know things like partial application. Maybe I should have picked better names here. Maybe this should have been something like is high and is low. Maybe that would have, or bet high and bet low, or I don't know. Uh, that maybe would have made it more obvious, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, again, naming is hard, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, let's shall go. Shall we move on to the next one then? Because there were no questions um, cool. All right. so that, that was... I could actually ask now. Yeah, so let's go to the next one. Okay. Yeah, and if people come up with things, we can always go back to questions later. It's it's cool. Like you said, we have plenty of time. So this color space one works a little bit differently. Um, it's not a game, uh, for starters. Uh, and... and when you actually go to, again, we'll do the same thing. We'll go ahead and run it first just to see what it looks like. Um, and I think we will find this actually somewhat less satisfying. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's not what I wanted. There's no FSI there. This is run. Here we are. Uh, da -da 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 -da. There you go. Okay. And okay, past 100 tests. This is, so running this program, this program is actually, what I, what I actually did with this one is I wrote the before and I wrote the after, and then I wrote uh, an actual property test to compare them, sort of taking on some of what Scott Blashin was talking about last time we, we all met virtually here, and sort of treating the before as kind of a test oracle uh, and knowing that if I get the same inputs out of both my before and my after, then my after is at least that correct. So, uh, but that's not very visually pleasing. That's not very interesting. So I also added the FSI, which works a little bit differently. Whenever it finishes compiling. Here, it just pulls three, it generates three colors at random and actually shows you that the before and after values are the same for the different colors. Oh, Paul is gone again. Let's wait. Wait, 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 wait. You're gone. You were gone. 
Um, with you need to restart. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> you need to restart with the FSI. Okay, so the full program just does a property test to compare the before and after implementations to make sure that they return the same values, but that's kind of boring to look at. So what the FSI does is it actually picks three colors at random and spits you out the values so you can see that, yes, in fact, the reason why your property tests are passing is because your before and after implementations are returning the same values. And you could see here that, you know, for, exa for example, for a light slate gray, it has those three RGB components, which map onto those three HSL components, which map onto those three HSV components. A um, little bit of background for people who are not maybe familiar with color space. There's lots of different ways to create mathematical models of color, and all of them have pros and cons. But uh, HSL and HSV are two that are closer to how the human eye sees them than RGB, which is, of course, optimized for your computer screen, for pixels. Um, and what we'll see is, when we go to the actual code is that we can do a lot of transformations, and the active patterns help make that a lot easier. Um, so, But before we do that, I do actually want to just uh, take two seconds and look at the difference between the FSX and the program itself. So the program itself, so first of all, I actually think this will read better if I do this. I don't know why I had the verbose generator on in the first place. Basically defines a simple test where for a given color, I go ahead and I calculate it against the before logic and the after logic. And then I do a simple property assertion, and then I run a, uh, an FS check test. So this is very much just me saying, look, somebody was listening when Scott was talking last week. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that's cool about this is now when I'm here in the uh, uh, script, I'm not actually doing a property test, but I am reusing the, the generators and the generation framework, the data generation framework in FS check to to generate data for other purposes, useful purposes. And that's a thing that I personally do a lot. It's maybe not sort of the most uh, on-label usage of FS check, but it's certainly quite quite uh, quite helpful in some scenarios. So that's that, little little side note. But then if we actually go look at the actual before and after, um, so it all starts with color from system.drawing which is a small struct uh, that actually is three bytes that, that basically encodes uh, all of the information about a color. And what we do for getting the color spaces is basically, so we get some information out of the color and then we uh, build up some formatted strings and then we construct an anonymous record containing those values. And you could see for RGB, those are just actual properties of the color uh, struct. Those are the principal components. And Microsoft very helpfully in the BCL gives you methods for getting the hue and saturation and brightness for HSV, or HSL rather. They call it brightness, but it really should be lightness, not brightness. Brightness. There's a, a technical difference there, but that's MSDN disagreeing with Wikipedia. Um, but then you have to do your own work to get hue, saturation, value, which is yet another color space. Um, fortunately, we create a little helper function to do that. Um, and this is the meat of the program. And ooh, it's maybe not the messiest thing ever, but it's messier than I would like. You know what I mean? I've got a whole bunch of, of tuple conversions, and I've I've got to do mins and maxes, and and then I've got sort of you know uh, this weird you know nested nested else's you know nested if else's and ternaries. Yeah. So, but in the end of the day, you wind up with given given a color, you wind up with three other values that represent that color. So. Um, we could go into the details of this if people really want, but that's the main idea. Um, I have this little 2% function, which just, again, uh, like the comment says, sometimes you get a real number, but it ought to be a percent. And it's just scaling things by 100 because percents make more sense sometimes. Um, 
And then one side note for the observant folks, why am I turning everything into strings instead of comparing the floats? That is because you can, you, I couldn't find a good way to get FS check to compare floats at a fixed level of precision. Uh, if anyone knows how to do that in FS check, please, please you know, send it to me on on GitHub or Twitter or anywhere because it drives me nuts that I'm doing an equality check on two floats and it's failing because the like twelfth decimal place is off. And I'm like, I'm sorry for this particular operation. <laughs> you know, six decimal places is plenty. And I couldn't find a way to tune that in FS check, so I decided to compare strings because I can control the precision on a string. Um, and honestly, I, I stopped it too because it's it's easier to read. But like, I could have ran that out to six, and it probably would work six or eight. So, um, so this, this is not terrible code, right? You know, it's 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 cool. We're 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 using Active Records. Yay, new feature everybody loves. And and we sort of know what's going on here. It's mathy, but we sort of know what's going on. Yes. Sorry, did I say active? I meant anonymous records. Oh God, too many, too many things. It sounds like I'm active records. Suddenly we're back in Ruby, and, and everybody's trying to hit their database with an active record. Oh no. Um, okay. We don't want uh, that. Anonymous the active records. record, right? Keeping me honest. Yes. No. We, we no. Me I don't neither. want the active record pattern. I never want. No. I'm done with those days. But again, this is not bad code, but we can make it better. We can absolutely make it better. So we go look at our after. And again, our after is actually, uh, uh, I guess, about five lines longer, uh, but I think is is a bit clearer. The first thing th to notice is that we lifted a bunch of calculations out into active patterns because it turns out that some of these things are fairly generic. And I'm using this to get an actual color space transformation for the sake of printing it, but other people might want these transformations for other purposes. There are there are legitimate, you know, applications of this in software. So we generalize these things a bit to some different, you know, we have some total patterns that are the names are hopefully fairly obvious. A total pattern for uh, extracting the RGB slice of a color struct. One for extracting the HSL slice of a color struct. One for extracting the HSV that actually makes use of the HSL. And you'll see later on that we also make use of this multi-case uh, total pattern where we want to see, we'll, we'll see what value is. The value in hue, saturation, and value always corresponds to either red, green, or blue. And you do a lot of that complex math we saw before is based on trying to figure out which one is the value. So we, we codify that as well. And then our actual color space function looks a little bit simpler. Um, I'm, again, building my anonymous record to contain my, my values. Instead of a helper function for printing them, I just print them directly because whatever. Um, I also didn't have a helper function for converting them to percentages because it seemed easy enough to just convert them in line because I've list, lifted a lot of the meat and the mess out. The cool part here is I'm actually using the single case total patterns to decompose directly in the function definition. Like if you look the the type of this function, it takes in a color. It doesn't take in a bunch of active patterns. It takes in a color struct. But I don't even have to think about that. And in addition to having these various single case total patterns, I'm using the uh, the and pattern to combine them, and I'm using the as pattern to alias them into a variable called color, which I use solely to pull the name out and stick it on the uh, anonymous record, because sometimes it's nice to have little pretty names for things like uh, saffron and uh, cobalt blue and things like that. So what do we actually do with these patterns? Well, the RGB one is the simplest one. You remember, color already defines an R, a G, and a B component. Um, so we just tuple them together. We also convert them to floats because they're bytes. And honestly, if I could do most of this math in terms of bytes, it would be easier. But HSV and HSL, the ranges they work in are um, are real range. They're you know they're not uh, they're continuous ranges. They're not disc they're not discretized. So working with with integral values is not a good fit. So, but otherwise, this is just a very simple mapping of color. HSL works very, very similarly. Um, again, using the uh, the get you get saturation and the wrongly named get brightness function, 
and again converting them to floats uh, and putting them into a tuple here. Interesting thing to note, according to the paper and the F sharp spec, you're supposed to include the name of the case uh, in front of the value. And for multi-case patterns, you actually have to do that. But as we've seen here, for uh, single case patterns, you actually don't have to. If you notice, this guy will work just fine, despite the fact that I didn't say that this value is actually of HSL. Um, but it is actually a, a recommended practice to do this because it provides consistency between the single case and the multiple case. Um, but just FYI, just fun thing I noticed while I was looking at this code, apparently you don't have to do that. And I knew you didn't have to do that, but I forgot. Anyway, um, so these are all very simple and okay. Maybe you made them slightly more useful than just dotting into the member, but how does that help us with HSV? Well, it helps a lot because this HSV is much simpler than the other HSV. Um, so if we go put them again, side by side, there's a whole bunch of gobbledygook happening before I even get around to you know line 29 where I return the HSV here, where I return the tuple. And so we try to clean that up a little bit to see if we can, and I think we can. And the way I think we do it is we basically put the hard part inside this we isolate the important part of the calculation, which is this determining which component, which principal component contributes the value, whether it's the red channel, the green channel, or the blue channel. Um, and then we can compute everything relative to that. Uh, you know. And so what does this multi-case active pattern actually look like? Well, well, this is interesting. So first of all, it's a multi-case active pattern that is again making use of a single case pattern as its input because patterns can get passed into pa patterns. Patterns can get passed into functions. They can be used in line. There's, there's lots of things you can do with them. And what do we do here? We do the important part of just determining the value, which is basically to normalize our, our primary component, our principal components, uh, and then to calculate the hue uh, effectively, whichever one is the largest, right? So it's basically just a a three-way comparison between, uh, you know, three values. Uh, is R bigger than G and B? Is G bigger than R and B? Or is B bigger than R and G? So it is, again, not really different code than I have here. It, it does, though, do the important thing of teasing apart the implicit business rules and making them explicit and properly sort of isolating the steps in the algorithm and making them a bit clearer and cleaner. Though this logic, as it's coded here in the before, follows much more closely to uh, procedural implementations you might see given on the internet, you know, for like, here's the algorithm in C or here's the algorithm in Python. Um, so good chance to make your algorithms clearer and more explicit by shifting to a declarative uh, approach. Um, once we know which component is the value, we also, uh, so we return whichever component is the value, but we also return the two components because they've already been normalized for us. And using those normalized values is important in calculating the shift and the step. So that's why that happens. And you can see here, again, naming is important. I specifically call out which one is the value just so it looks a little bit better. And then once you know the value, you can determine the shift uh, based on the other components that are not the value. And you can determine if there's an offset that needs to be applied, a step in the, the range. The range is often called the chroma. This is just a you know, simple calculation based on data we defined before. And then here, same idea. We do finally hue and saturation. Um, so value is the V in HSV, right? It's hue, saturation, value. So we got that right, right away. Um, from that, we back into chroma. Using chroma, we back into hue and saturation, our H and our S. And we can have an achromatic uh, color, meaning it has no hue and no saturation. Um, or we can have something with a hue and a saturation, and then we return the case. So. That is that. So I, I kind of, uh, you know, 
that's more going in deep and sort of taking apart something and trying to make it a bit cleaner and more maintainable. <laughs> So questions at this point, because this is pretty much the end of me talking about things. I don't uh, don't have questions about this thing. I have a couple of uh, wows. <laughs> um, <clears throat> especially, I also didn't never thought about this um, using the the end operator in a. Um, in the destruction uh, or in the in the pattern match in in your function definition for destructuring uh, all this stuff this oh, is yeah. Uh, yeah it can it can absolutely yeah. get a little out of control and a little taken away and you know my 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 rule of thumb for these things is if you can make it read cleanly and intelligently for your domain and still fit it in 80 characters go for it yeah that that's pretty <laughs> That's my, my little my, my little markers here 80 100 120 80 is what i aim for 100 is is sort of splitting the distance, splitting the difference, and 120 is my absolute. Okay, if I if I hit a, a line that's more than 120 characters, yeah. definitely time to yeah, wrap it yeah. up. So, um, and j j just to bring it back to the presentation for just a, a second, um, if we go all the way back to this slide, you can see there's the uh, where do we put the, the 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 or pattern that everyone's familiar with, and there's the and pattern. So yeah, that, that's just me. You know, sort of using that outside of a match, but that's just the best part about pattern matching, whether it's active patterns or just the built-in pattern matching. You can use them in match statements. Yeah. You can use them in uh, lets and in anywhere you have a binding, basically. Uh, and you can also use the type test and the other patterns as part of, of try catch or try with for dealing. Yeah, with, for me, uh, it was also this this first class yeah. citizen. This notion of first class citizens, I never really thought about. Just to be honest, um, you having having um, active patterns as parameters or as values for functions and partially apply them and do all this stuff with them. This is pretty, yeah. for me at least, um, pretty cool stuff to see. I have to I have to be honest. Code like this, uh, where you actually have the parameter yeah. to the function is an active pattern, but it's not a specific, but it's just any active yeah. pattern that has that shape. Like that's, that's the thing this doesn't really show very well. I should really update this. Like we happen to be passing this Lambda active pattern into unfold. We could pass any yeah. partial active pattern that takes whatever this input type is and spits out to whatever these two values are. Um, and, and I can tell you from the, the types that like, this is a, this is B, and this is A. So any any part, any part, active pattern that goes from A to an option of B, A can go into that unfold. And like this doesn't really demonstrate that, but like you could do, you know, it wouldn't even yeah. have to be related to this, uh, this union of expression. It could be anything, which is really cool and powerful. And you actually don't see those too often because it's almost a little too mind-bending. <laughs> it's almost a little too, yeah. you really got to reach for it. But uh Certainly, the partially applying of them is is good juju, is, is is quite good bang for the buck. That's why I often say, I know like people when they come into a statically typed functional programming, you know, monads and lenses have the big shiny oh, but Haskell has it, and everybody talks about it in 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 Scala, and I got to learn this. And you know, type providers demo really well and seem really cool, and computation expressions are are a wonderful uh, language oriented tool for building DSLs. But in terms of really bang for your buck, the learning curve and the amount of effort and the amount of overhead relative to what you get out of them, active patterns have such a, huge, such a massively uh, beneficial mm -hmm. power to weight ratio. Like there's not that much there. It doesn't contribute much overhead. Uh, in a lot of cases, they can be inlined. Um, like you could put inline on them and the compiler will attempt to inline the active patterns. Um, just talking a bit about performance. Uh, in some cases, they do get optimized at least partially away. Um, especially in the case of total patterns, they, they can be optimized out pretty well. Um, there could be more optimizations made, sort of like fusing things together a bit more in, in the partial pattern space. And there is an open, uh, approved in principle RFC that is in the early stages, needs a lot of work, about whether or not uh, active patterns could be made to use value option 
and introduce sort of a value choice or a struct based basically use use struct based variants of active patterns in order to have less allocations in certain scenarios um i don't know it's it's a worthwhile goal i guess i i personally don't feel too strongly about it because my feeling is you're talking about a construct that is language mm -hmm. level that is really designed for readability where you're going to err on the side of this code might be a couple of milliseconds slower but is more readable is more aligned to my domain whereas if i'm really worried about the extra allocations in a tight loop i might yeah. actually give up the yeah. active pattern because if you, know, you really have this stuff that, and then most of the time in all this business yeah, logic or yeah, business have, software stuff you most of the time you don't need to think about it, I guess, all these allocations and, and, and yeah. Um, GC. Yeah. And, yeah. Especially, especially the amount of things I see people doing lately where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good work, but it's forms over data. It's, you know, what, what it's got, what Scott calls yeah. boring line of business applications. It's things that are in the best case scenario, the latent the 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 latency and the performance is lower bounded by an http request and the inherent you know uh delays therein so it's like uh, you know pe people make a, i think sometimes too much of performance especially anyway. in .net so, um, so yeah, i really have to say this coming not from .net and especially with all the garbage collection and mm -hmm. this is such a huge topic always so it it's an important topic and um but uh, but i oh, think absolutely. i also think in in I those also, business applications yeah. Yeah. You might not always need to think about this at, yeah. uh, from the beginning on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's about context, right? Like if you're if you're if you're if you're build if you're if you're building a first-person shooter or your Microsoft and you're building something like ASP.NET Core, then yeah, you probably do have to spend a lot of time thinking about your allocations and thinking about your your your, your native access and things like that. If you're if you're doing sort of this higher level stuff where correctness yeah. is more important than speed, yeah. then you know. Right tool for the job, and you know, not no one approach for all different contexts and all that. So, yeah. okay, cool. So, um, let, yeah, let me see. Any other questions? Um, there was it was already answered, but I just want to put this here so not that anyone has to read your um, has to read this um, chat. So, uh, can you call an active pattern as a normal function? So, Dave Thomas, seven sharp nine, already answered with yes. You just enclose it with um, braces. Yep. In fact, you can see an example of that. Uh, bu, 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 the, the same way, if if we go back and look uh, here on this slide, in fact, that uh, on that very last line, yeah. that mm -hmm. lambda pattern, that's just treating it like a function. That's using the full bracing closed, piping closed syntax. That's just a function. So, for instance, if I come here, I could do something like uh, where is, yeah, like if I wanted to do, I don't know why I would do this. But if I wanted, like, uh, uh, there's me calling the RGB active pattern as though it were a regular function and passing it the color mm -hmm. Alice blue. So, okay, cool. You know, it's very, very much you absolutely can do it. And there are places where I will on occasion do that because best of both worlds, right? Like sometimes you want to match on something. Sometimes you, you want to actually invoke a function. I mean, how many times has there been an API where it's a function and I've got to do like a, a match on it when I really, or I've, I've got to invoke a function when what I really want to do is a match on it. You know, like I'm thinking about all the times where I've got to do something like, you know, uh, you know, I've got a lambda somewhere, and I want to do function. You know, some blah uh, true or, or you know, you know, none blah false, mm -hmm. right? You know, you do a thing like that. What you really actually want to be able to do is is basically this, right? And of course, you can do like you know that. But then you've got to bring in the, the option module. And yeah. obviously for options, it's not a big yeah. deal. But you can imagine in more complex types, these sorts of things become more complicated. But active patterns are a nice win here because I can do that. Now, fun side effect, side note, this is the same as doing, you know, this. So this is one of those things about F sharp that I do find a little frustrating is that oh, really? uh, <laughs> if you strictly use the, if you strictly use the fun keyword, you will have to on in some cases, not always, but in some cases, you will have to uh, parenthize like this 
or on occasion, like one that always annoys me is if I can, there's an active pattern called key value that pulls the key and the value out of a key value pair, right? And this is a mm -hmm. part of the standard library. And I can do this with it. But if I go ahead, and, and this, you know, this, this line uh, 60 here, this totally works. But if I go ahead and use the function keyword, I can drop the outer set okay. of parentheses. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, huh? That's odd. <laughs> so there are weird corner cases like that when you're trying to use active patterns for certain things, but by and large, definitely worth the investment. Yeah, um, there's basically a discussion going on in the chat, but also a couple of questions earlier. It's, it's like the general usage. So, so I just read a couple of things and then we can make a, a thing out of it. So, so Paul, can you discuss some examples of where you're using active patterns and what time and effort it saved you? And then... The question is, um, da, 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 let me see. How do you think about active patterns? How do you know some problem will be good to solve with active patterns? And some answers is, it's um, yeah, when your code starts to become too imperative, um, that's the moment you can start considering. But then there is also the question like, um, do you start with normal DUs and later on you just go to active patterns or the other way around? Or so basically you're. I would try to boil it down to, to what is your everyday usage of active patterns or this concept? Um, yeah. Fair. fair enough. Fair enough. And, and I, I think, I think the most important thing, uh, uh, uh truthfully, the, the, the place where it really most imp importantly jumps out is when you find yourself in this scenario, when you've got code that, is very imperative or is very procedural and is very um, not declarative, not matchable, and here's the caveat, and, and or very much types you don't own, types you don't control, right? That's, that's sort of, I guess, my, my guidelines for active patterns. Because if I control the type or I control the API, uh, I can just go change it to be what I want. But like all, all the cases where I wind up using active patterns, for the most part, with one or two exceptions, for the most part, wind up being it's a BCL type or it's somebody else's DU or it's something like that or it's from a third-party library. And so I can't change the type, but I don't necessarily want the overhead of defining and maintaining my own union my own wrapper type i don't need that level of functionality i just need the existing type to look a little different that's that's usually my my gut reaction there is is with that though i will use them in my own code uh even if i control the types if i want to enable both matching and functions like what i'll very often do is define a type and define some active patterns against that type and then go ahead and define functions against that type that use the active patterns uh, because it's nice to be able to pattern match on things sometimes. It depends on, um, like they really exist in this gray space where in the sort of hybrid, not quite object, not quite function space. And again, in this space of not quite algorithm, not quite data. Um, so it really, it really, um, I wish I could come up with a quick, one line bullet thing, but by and large, the, the, the big indicators for me are I don't control the type. Mm -hmm. Things are becoming, and or things are becoming too procedural, too imperative, and or I want to enable matching scenarios, but that's more of just like a, you find out you want to enable matching mm -hmm. scenarios after the okay. fact. Um, one of the everyday uses though that I, I think is, is key that I, I do want to go back to because you do I, I think this is certainly for some subset of the community this sort of thing where I've got a data structure and there are inherently patterns in that data structure like for instance a list of events a sequence of events a particular ordering of certain events with certain values forms a pattern that sort of pattern abstraction that sort of uh pattern mining that you might do like with, like i mean obviously we're not talking about like machine learning or ai stuff but um this notion of i have a data type it works perfectly well but i know that there are patterns inside of it that's another place where like mm, that's a, a thing that pushes mm -hmm. me towards active patterns 
Yeah, I can totally see this also in business scenarios where you might even have things like event sourcing or something, and then you want to s just just react yeah. to something in a, in kind of a process manager. I, I can see, for example, a process manager that is mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. reacting to to a mm -hmm. specific sequence of events with specific uh, constraints on them, and only do, is doing something if these constraints mm -hmm. are there. And then you, then you could actually name those. That might be a pretty nice help a thing yeah. um that that be, and because you only use it or you might only use it in there um that might be a pretty nice helper thing to actually use those in those sagas or or process managers or whatever exactly exactly you know uh, i i have in the past worked at places where we did a lot of stream processing like uh parts of the work i did at jet.com when i used to work there and a few other places and um Anytime you've got something where your logical model is map reduce, yeah. there's probably I'm not saying you're physically doing map reduce in the distributed computing sense of like you know like big table or whatever, but where the logical model is that yeah basically that projecting line, into something yeah you probably yeah you probably have an opportunity to make things a bit more uh, domain focused and a bit more blessed with uh, with active patterns in that way so that's another good thing to look for is these patterns of data coming out of things so uh, hopefully those those three things just to just to reiterate sort of what leads you to everyday usage of active patterns it's reshaping types you don't control um code that's that's too imperative too procedural not declarative enough uh, uh patterns that emerge from from otherwise functional data um and uh, those are the big ones i i Cool. I mean, those are the big ones, really. The oh, then then the fourth pattern is again to go back to quotations. Um, quotations are the, sort of the 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 boilerplate mm -hmm. example of this, and um, a thing I think people don't use more. There's this notion that I think originated in the Haskell community, or might have originated in the O'Connell community, of an abstract data type. You know, so a different meaning of ADT, not algebraic data type, but abstract data type, meaning a, a data type that is described in terms of its operations. You know, basically having a layer of encapsulation and hiding to the internal representation. Oh, you're gone, you're gone, you're gone. You're gone, you're gone, you're gone. One sec, he will be back. Sorry, 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 Paul. Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> sorry, um, you were gone again. What, what yeah, did, the did abstract data tape. Oh, what, what did I cut off? Type. Okay. So the idea of an abstract data type is a data type whose only interpretable in terms of its operations, like its mm -hmm. externals aren't exposed. You know, because for better or worse, you know, uh, and I'm going to riff a bit here, but, uh, you know, a, a union like this, right? Okay, error. The externals are exposed, right? There's a there's a symmetricality to this type, and that's a, a lot of times where maybe what you want is you want result to be, uh, you know, to be opaque. You don't want people to know what the actual type is. So what you might do then is instead, you know, there, and there are ways to obviously hide the internals, uh, whether it's through private and careful use of modules or signature files or whatever. You know, maybe you want to do something like this where. It's actually its implementation is actually internal, is private, it's encapsulated, it's hidden. I can change it and evolve it over time, but the API, the public API, is still presented as though it's a union, right? Um, this is very much what we do with quotations. This is very much a potential way one could implement a type like result or like option. Now, those are not how they're written because there is a merits, like I said. But this is a thing that, that actually uh, Don actually talks about in the paper that introduces active patterns. The idea that library authors, more so than application authors, like a lot of the other uses we've talked about are very much for application authors, people who are doing business stuff, but library authors have this burden of once your API becomes public, mm -hmm. it immediately starts to calcify. You're, you're beholden to that. And so you can potentially use active patterns as a form of encapsulation, as a form of data hiding. So the internals, the implementation are free to change over time, but the API stays fixed in a tractable way. You can also use it to gradually replace an API. You know what I mean? Um, I've definitely done that in a few places. Before a result was actually a, a proper part of F-sharp core, uh, I did some work uh, and we actually had our own result type that was built on top of choice two, that was just aliasing choice two, and we used an active pattern to make it look like result so 
so that when we upgraded the version of F# -sharp Core and suddenly had result, there was oh, it just took it, this out. It was yeah. seamless to callers and consumers. Yeah. yeah, we just had a little conditional compilation and and the so so it offers benefits in that way. And I think one of the reasons why the quotations API to come back to it again for like the 85th time <laughs> works the way it does is that is that very much came out of when F# -sharp was still a Microsoft research project and not a production tool. And I think they very much wanted to be able to have an easy way to optimize the internals of quotations. Now, I don't know if they ever actually have, and I mean, and to hear certain people, you know, uh, complain about the performance of it, probably they haven't, but they've got a vector for doing that. They've got a means of achieving that without breaking everyone, uh, if they're not too silly. Um, because they've, like, if you look at the actual type definition for expression or, or var in the quotation space, they don't really expose any internals. It's all through static members or active patterns. So I think that's another use case if you're thinking more like a library author and less like an application author, less like a line of business developer. So yeah, really maybe that cool. also helps. Awesome. Okay, um, I don't think we have any more questions left. And we have talked about let me see one and a half hours now so it's a good time yeah, yeah really it's about cool. 90 minutes yeah so, so there you go. um That's... i had a lot of fun i learned a lot actually um i think a lot of people as well thank you i had i had a time um, to yeah thank you for yeah, having definitely. me thanks for coming <laughs> and, and and supporting this and um yeah so that's it. That's our second, the end uh, of our second online meetup. I hope that we can be back. Um, Paul, why are you wearing a hat? <laughs> because it looks good. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I hope to, to, to be back in. No, no I, I, honestly, the, the, the hat is a funny story. If people Go for it. Go for it. Know, the, the funny story is literally... Uh, uh, like 10 minutes before I, I was getting set up for this talk, I was, I was putting my daughter to bed and, and it was a little dark and I wasn't paying attention and I, I smacked my head on the, the corner of her crib and I have a big gash in my head. So rather than having everyone stare at my Band-Aid all night, I just put on the hat and look stylish. And then, this is you know, not your my, best my silly, week with uh, accidents uh, with your child, my, right? My, my silly <laughs> leopard print Band-Aid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I can totally uh, relate to this. On the last conference I've been to, um, in the middle of the night, I went to the toilet <laughs> without my glasses and I didn't switch the light mm -hmm. on and so I took a turn right too early and I completely hit the door frame with my <laughs> with my head oh, and it was oh, like 12 o'clock yeah. in the night and I was bleeding and it was like I thought I had to get stitches so I can totally relate to this in the middle of a conference but anyway um, I hope that we can be back in two weeks time again we have we don't have a speaker mm, yet we have a cool. couple of people um, um, writing us we're trying to figure things out and really want to do a a lightning talk session soon where we'll have like two or three or maybe four 10 to 20 minute lightning talks um so again if you have any topic just write me write um to the f sharp at f sharp online um twitter our direct messages are open just send us something or or connect to roman or to me uh, on Twitter, on YouTube, wherever in the F# -sharp Slack, um, if you have any ideas for a good talk, we are really try to push um, divers diversity as well. So, if you are not the male speaker, it would be awesome if if we had just um, if you just could contact us, and we would really like to support you here uh, on this on this user group. And I would love to have this. Um, this lightning talk session where we could have a real panel discussion and um, talk to people about um, many different topics. So would be really cool um, to see this in the future. I hope that you make some advertisement for us. I hope to see you in the future. Thanks to everyone for joining. We had a lot of people. I think our, our, our peak was 150 people at the same time, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's, wow. nice. that's really nice. nice. Um, so, and still there are almost 100 watching, so my blabbering. So let's just wrap this up and have a good <laughs> night. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul.